You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bomer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoSchedulemen.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. Hi, I'm Kevin. Thanks for finding and taking some time with us. We're here to explore personal development and to show you that you can achieve and grow and expand into your potential. And we do that by discovering and sharing the stories of real people who have done just that. Today's guest is David Cicerelli. He's the CEO and founder of Voices.com, which is an industry-leading website that connects businesses with professional voice talent. Now, Voices.com is used by radio and TV stations, advertising agencies, and a wide variety of Fortune 500 companies who rely on David and his team to be able to help them search for, audition, and hire voice talent. Just some of the companies that have been served by Voices.com include NBC, ABC, PBS, Cisco, DreamWorks, Microsoft, and the History Channel, to name only a handful of them. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to just give you a quick idea of the scale of this business, at least at the time of this recording. Every single month, Voices.com receives about 2,600,000 page views from 400,000 unique visitors to their site. 3,500 jobs or thereabout are posted every single month on Voices.com, with the average turnaround time to completion of those jobs being about 48 hours. Pretty incredible efficiency. There are a quarter million registered users on Voices.com at this time, half of which are voice talent and half of which are the clients who hire them. Now, in this conversation, you're going to hear how that all started, where the ideas came from, how David and his wife Stephanie acted upon those ideas and have evolved into where they are today. Some lessons and takeaways to listen for in this discussion. One is keep moving forward and taking action. Be willing to figure it out as you go. If you keep waiting for the path ahead to look perfect, you'll never move ahead. So just get started and trust that you'll learn and evolve along the way. You will because you'll have to. Here's another. Be creative and be resourceful. Money isn't always the answer. Look around you. There are tools people and information right close by if only you condition yourself to be able to look for them and to see them sometimes the next step is a lot simpler than we think it is like for instance going to the library which you're going to hear david mention here's one more make decisions you've got to trust yourself to be able to see an opportunity and decide to keep moving except right now that many of those decisions are going to work out But some are not going to. But there's always going to be another decision to be made. You simply can't continue to move forward and be indecisive at the same time. David gives some terrific insights on that subject in particular during our discussion. Now, to give you an idea before the discussion starts here, the conversation with David, to give you a bit of an idea of the demands on his time at the time of this recording, as CEO of this global company, Voices.com, David is responsible for setting the vision executing the growth strategy, creating a vibrant culture, and managing the whole thing on a day-to-day basis. He's been published in Forbes magazine, The Wall Street Journal, Entrepreneur, and The Globe and Mail, and has delivered speeches at a variety of venues, such as the 2016 Digital Media Summit and at Western University here in London, Ontario. So as you can imagine, David's days are scheduled out to the minute, But his assistance could not have been more helpful in making this podcast happen. And the environment at Voices.com is truly vibrant and welcoming. So, given what I just told you, just how exactly did I manage to get on David's calendar and get this much of his time? Because I asked and did all of the things that I just mentioned, which David is going to cover in this conversation, which I think you're going to love. Here's my chat with David Cicerelli, CEO of Voices.com on the No Schedule Man podcast. I'm interested to know, David, kind of what your aspirations were when you were younger. 
Maybe I can put it into context. Sure. It, I think I was in grade six when I decided, funny because we were just talking about baseball, <laughs> um, when I decided I was going to be the next play-by-play broadcaster for the Detroit Tigers. Right. And I did get into radio, so I sort of stayed on that of course. path. Um, but what about little mini David Cicerelli running around? What, what did you think were some of your aspirations back then? Well, I wanted to be a pilot. You know, it started there. Really? Yeah. Uh, always enjoyed airplanes. I drew uh, lots of airplanes. Um, and I remember I had this one binder full of, uh, you know, uh, not just the planes, but I would draw kind of the branding, the colors on the tail wing, right? And they always had their logos there. So uh, I ended up uh, finding this one book from the bookstore that like, it was like the complete encyclopedia of every airline that ever existed. And it had all the color. I just thought that was amazing. So I wanted to be a pilot. Um, and, uh, you know, after that kind of moved into maybe something engineering, architectural, uh, played a lot of Legos as a kid. In fact, one of our family trips was over to, uh, over to Europe and we visited Denmark and that's the headquarters of Legoland. Uh, and, uh, there it wasn't just kind of the little Lego sets and kits that you kind of put together might've gotten at Christmas time, but instead they were like nine foot tall, you know, Kennedy space station kind of shuttles, you know, and almost like full size cities. They were like middle mini cities. Uh, so I always like, I enjoyed city planning and architecture and, in in some ways, uh, you know, speaking of kind of your childhood aspirations playing out, uh, I'd like to think that, you know, mine did as well. And, and what I'm, you know, what we're building here and uh, at Voices is really uh, building a company. And there's a lot of design and thought process that needs to go into how you, uh, you know, lay out the office to design systems and kind of put all these pieces together. So I'd like to think that I'm still on that same path. It's interesting to hear you talking about a nine foot space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And the, the word that's coming to my mind while you're talking about some of that stuff that I also see as it relates to voices.com mm -hmm. is scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're talking about models and drawing and something of like course. that, it seems to be sort of following you around, mm -hmm. but let's, I'm curious just mm -hmm. to go back to the, the airplanes for why airplanes? What was it that, interested you about flying at that time oh, maybe it was it was as close to time travel as you could get i'd i'd you know the fact that you could compress time and space by um you know being in the sky and uh, i get you know the whole notion of visiting uh new cultures new lands seeing new sites meeting new people i think that was that was always really interesting to me you know again growing up we we didn't um have a cottage or another kind of summer house or any particular vacation spot instead um you know i i remember this mom and dad sitting down the the kids and you know asking would you know if we if we could uh would we rather you know you know buy a cottage you know that was something that they were maybe considering um and it would be the same place that we went to every summer and spend our summers there or uh would we rather take trips and uh travel and uh all of us were like yeah let's go on some trips you know hey our friends have camps and cottages if we want to go there we can go there we were you know we felt we kind of had that as a as a, an option already but so few people traveled and we just uh, you know really kind of seized that and um you know we were fortunate enough to uh, to visit europe a number of times and uh long road trips throughout the u.s and literally driving from Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is the tip of uh, Lake Superior, all the way to California and up the coast and oh, wow. back through Canada. And that was like a four or five week trip in the summer. We, those kind of things, like extreme traveling to a degree. Brave parents. Absolutely. Doing that. Yeah. <laughs> You've got siblings? Uh, I have a brother and a sister as well. And you were all, I can remember my sisters and I, I was usually squashed in the middle. I think maybe I've tried to block it from my memory yeah. in the old, uh, yeah, the Griswold family station That's wagon. Right. Were you all of an age where you could travel together for a time? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I'm the youngest, and, uh, you know, we had a, one of those, uh, even before the minivans, um, there were like these big kind of uh, caravan type, um, <laughs> almost quasi buses, if you will. Yep. But we had one of those, um, and so there's the five of us with all the camping gear and, 
you know, we weren't staying in hotels. It was just campgrounds, and we just kind of plotted that next spot. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced there wasn't exactly a plan other than, you know, let's get to the coast and then drive up the coast. Uh, but, no, I mean, obviously great memories from that. And uh, so I had my spot. And we, we played the license plate game, actually, uh, which was uh, to spot uh, license, new license plates from different uh, states and provinces from the oncoming traffic. Uh, and uh, every 10th one kind of, you know, won a prize, like a chocolate bar or something like that. Um, but I was always keen to kind of get to the 10th one. But, of course, my brother would suddenly wake up when it was, like, number 9 or number 10 or 19 and on the, to the 20th, and he would claim the prize uh, right at the end. But uh, I, I would always have to remind him, like, you got to play the game along the way, you know, get all those, uh, name those plates and name those uh, states and provinces uh, before you can claim the prize. But, no, that was, that was good fun. So we, we actually still play the license plate game in our family now. We didn't have any prizes, but I remember going on family trips and I would try to touch – the plates of different states and stuff like that. Wow. Okay. Well, Sounds yeah, kind you, of silly, but it's in the same thing. You have to be close thing. to them to do that. Well, <laughs> I didn't typically look for oncoming traffic. No. I remember a lot of Bob Evans parking lots right. and things like that, but uh, it's funny to, to hear you say that. So when you're thinking about traveling to new places and architecture and, and all of the other things that appeal to, to you about what you just described, you're a school age kid at this point, mm-hmm. right? So what do you remember of the time when you're transitioning in through high school and then and post-secondary, and what were your focuses at, at those times? Well, um, you know, I, I played in a band. Uh, you know, mom... Uh, Tuba? Uh, no, I played... Tr- I, well, I played trumpet. <laughs> I should have been playing drums the whole time. See, mom put me through uh, piano lessons. Um, I think she always wanted to have, have a piano in the house. Uh, and then when she got the piano, she realized she needed a piano player. Uh, and I became the piano player. So she put me through lessons. I went through the music conservatory for 12, 13 years um, and ended up writing my own songs. And uh, so when it came time to, uh, you know, and then uh, in high school, uh, I think she, I don't know if there was anger issues or whatnot, or maybe it was just a teenage frustration. She said, look, you're either getting a punching bag or a drum kit. So you take your pick. And I'm like, all right, drum kit it is. Uh, so got a drum kit. Uh, I feel, felt that was kind of in line with the music uh, nature and played drums and uh, keys and uh, throughout high school and in bands and so forth. And w- when it was time to graduate, I uh, actually came across a uh, specialized school, one that's uh, here in London, Ontario, called the Ontario Institute of Audio Recording Technology. So this was a, a specialized, dedicated program um, raising up uh, and, and teaching uh, aspiring uh, you know, sound and music professionals on how to be audio engineers. The, the guys and girls that sit on the other side of the recording studio glass that, uh, that are you know, recording uh, and producing you know, audio content. Most of it, of course, make, makes sense that it would be uh, music, um, but you know, learn that there's music for movies and music nowadays, obviously, there's a variety of kind of new media that it, that it tapes shape. So that that was the path I went. I, I I never actually went to kind of a traditional you know college or university, if you will. Um, but I think it was I think it was the right one. So when you were doing that program, mm-hmm. as best as you can recollect, what were you thinking was the way through where, where you were going to go or what you were hoping to do with with those skills that uh, that you were learning? Well, I wanted to I wanted to start. A studio. I didn't know what that kind of looked like um, until I was through the school. Um, I mean, there were other career opportunities that were interesting. Um, you know, so I could have worked at another studio, uh, maybe the you know CBC or CTV. You know, those are kind of aspirations of, of some of the feather, fellow students. Um, there was even an opportunity to be kind of the you know the the sound guy, if you will, on uh, cruise ships. Uh, they had some. Uh, you know, number of leads and number of students who had actually had kind of done that. Um, but my heart was set on kind of that entrepreneurial path. I just wanted to, um, you know, build a small studio myself. And in fact, uh, this was in the year 2000, uh, which was the first year that uh, the sur- like reality TV was a brand new concept. And it was the first year that Survivor was coming online. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. How is the guy doing sound? remotely in the outback of Australia and there ended up ended up finding these threads uh online of this fellow to kind of describing that he has this professional grade uh, remote recording studio 
uh, using all the latest technology, and he was just running it off of, of what was then the first Apple uh, laptop called the Wall Street. It was the first Apple laptop that they came out with. And so my, my uh, curiosity was piqued and literally wrote down the list of all the equipment that this fellow was using and uh, pitched the idea to, uh, you know, to my parents of saying, hey, like, I think you know, after graduating, I want to start up a studio and have it, this mobile recording studio. And they were really supportive. They, they thought it was a great idea. I think, you know, uh, they saw that it was entrepreneurial. Uh, and there's lots of stories around, uh, around that growing up as well, too. But, um, you know, I ended up securing a, a small loan, uh, which, uh, which my dad co-signed for, which is likely the only way I got it. Um, but it was enough to, to kind of cobble together that first uh, recording studio. And I did remote audio recording uh, on a laptop. Um, of you know bands uh music groups kind of in practice rooms and i would go to uh to the musician's place and, and record on site there and then come back to my place and, and mix it down and and that's uh that's kind of how i figured out that i wanted to both be an entrepreneur and apply um the skills and knowledge that i had for this passion of of audio I find myself wanting to take a quick diversion and just ask you out of sheer curiosity if um, if you're a Star Wars guy. Uh, yeah, we watch Star Wars for sure. In fact, actually, my um, my son, who's now uh, 12, um, he he's really into this kind of superhero bent, uh, which you know before was Lord of the Rings, and and uh, then it was Star Wars. You know, and now we're on to uh, various kind of Marvel characters. But, there's a there's know. a reason why I'm asking yeah, you, and that's that? well because of, um, I get the sense that you're probably not dissimilar to me in that if you mm. get a DVD of a film that you like, you enjoy having that, and we'll go back and watch certain scenes of here course, and there. Yeah. But what you really like to dig into is the behind the scenes stuff. How did they do that? Sure. And I love the behind the scenes about Star Wars with Ben Burt. Mm -hmm. and how he did the sound design, mm -hmm. and how he decided that he could go out in the hills of California and strike a power line with a wrench or something, and it would make that blaster sound or right. something like that. And so as you're describing being out with this mobile recording rig mm -hmm. and also having watched things and wondered, you know, how do they do, how do you mm -hmm. figure that out? Uh, it's a different sort of a thought process than a lot of other people go through because you're just sort of letting the experience wash over them. Right. Like, I'm the kind of guy that I'll go to Disney World and I'll move the the uh, garbage cans. <laughs> and <laughs> somebody that was with me would say, what are you doing? So, well, I'm just, I'm curious. I haven't ever seen a full garbage can, but I haven't seen anyone empty it. So I wanted to see whether it was just going down into the ground. I had to know how it worked. Right. Sorry, a diversion from a no, diversion. No, not at all. There, and, and in fact, on that, on that <laughs> thought, I mean, uh, I've heard anyway and, and not walked through the halls myself, but there's an entire underground city. Yeah, right, that's what uh, I heard too. Right, uh, at, at Disney. Uh, no, I mean, on, on the sound design piece as well, like, uh, you know, hearing uh, and discovering that, you know, in most fight scenes, um, you know, the sound of somebody kind of punching another person is actually, you know, uh, celery sticks being kind of beaten and crushed. Like that's the sound of crunching bones is actually celery sticks getting beaten there. Like some, you know, slippery, slimy, you know, monster or something along those lines might be uh, literally dog food kind of slurping out of a can. Like that's kind of the sound that they that they come up with. So it's infinite possibility. So you're, re you're trying to recreate life and make it as realistic as, as possible. And sometimes you need to be creative and find what is the equivalent of that. And probably your ears are always on listening for, you know, what could be. Uh, but yeah, Ben Bird obviously is a legend in the in the space. Yeah, well, we could go and tell stories with mm -hmm. that, but we're never going to get around to voices. So <laughs> I, and I want to make sure that we do that. So let's go back to where you were, where you've got the mobile recording mm -hmm. business. How did that evolve, and what was the next step? I actually, uh, you know, when I graduated, uh, as I said, I had that initial recording kind of rig, um, um, and uh, the first kind of big step was finding a uh, a location. Actually, I realized I need a kind of home base. Uh, here in the city and as much as I wanted to go out to people I realized that there's actually some people who didn't actually have a location um, bands were one thing but independent musicians or singer songwriters they actually needed somewhere to come to uh, so I actually uh, found a place downtown here 
um, above a restaurant. And uh, I had a recording studio in the front uh, bit of it um, and a little kind of, you know, loft apartment, if you will, in the back. Uh, so I lived and worked in this in the same space. Uh, and it was then, um, you know, I have to tell the story about uh, getting my name in the newspaper on my birthday. Uh, it was because the, the local newspaper picked up the story of the studio opening up and, uh, and ran it. And uh, what I didn't realize, though, is that uh, Stephanie, who's now my wife and, and co-founder in the company, um, her mom actually uh, cut out this newspaper article and left it for her on, on her bed. Because you see, Stephanie was a classically trained uh, musician. She, she, was a, she was a singer. She was a Western uh, University music uh, student. And she would sing at weddings and funerals and special events. And her mom, I think, uh, I'm convinced she was, uh, she was tired of carpooling her, uh, her daughter around to go audition for people and you know, get these gigs and so forth. And her mom saw the newspaper article and thought, well, why don't you go in and record a demo CD? Uh, and we're going back, of course, 10 years now. But go and get a demo CD done of your, of your voice, sing some of your repertoire. So Stephanie came in and uh, you know, we ended up, uh, we hit it off. We ended up doing that work together. Uh, but there was other small businesses in town that um, that wanted a, a voiceover done. I didn't really kind of know what that was, to be honest. They they said, "Hey, do you think you know you can record, uh, you know, have somebody record for our phone system?" And we want a female voice. Well, I knew only Stephanie in the city. I didn't really know anybody else. And and there was a hair salon that wanted some commercials done. And and uh, same deal. They wanted a, they wanted a lady to uh, to do this voiceover. And I called Stephanie. And I said, "Do you think you can come down and?" Uh, read this page of copy. It wasn't, I didn't kind of coin it as, can you do a voiceover for me? I don't think neither of us even knew what that was, uh, uh, you know, particularly. So we, uh, we ended up doing that. And, um, you know, I should kind of uh, insert in there that, um, you know, Stephanie uh, likes to say it got romantic, which I think, uh, you know, after we met each other, we ended up, you know, getting engaged and, and married uh, within a year. And, uh, you know, now, as, as, uh, as you know, we have four wonderful kids and, um, and really kind of know nothing else other than, you know, working together uh, and living and working together and kind of eat, eat breathe, sleep and kind of run this business. Uh, but it's been pretty much the same idea of, of what initially began as myself as the engineer and, uh, you know, producer and, and uh, you know, editor, if you will. But uh, myself as the engineer and Stephanie as the artist, um, we figured out how to do voiceover work. And so we slapped together a pretty, uh, frankly, pretty brutal website. In fact, we went down to the local, uh, <laughs> local public library uh, and took out web design for dummies. Uh, and we, we hacked together our own website from scratch. Like nowadays... There was, you know, WordPress and Weebly and Wix.com and all these things that you can literally point and click and make a website. But back then there was nothing. There was, you, there was a hosting service, you know, you'd sign up for, for, you know, 20 bucks a month. And then that was kind of it. You got like login access, but whatever you wanted to, pages you wanted to build, there was no, you know, kind of editing tools like that. Uh, so we literally built the initial version of the website one page at a time. Uh, and taught ourselves everything through reading that book. Uh, and the initial, the site was really promoting the studio. Um, and Stephanie is the one voice talent that was available. And it wasn't long before there were other, uh, there were other talent from around North America, across North America, um, that wanted to be on the website. They discovered it somehow. Maybe we came up in Google or what, what have you. And uh, there was a guy from California who did character voices and, and animated uh, celebrity impressions as well, too. And then there was a, there was this, a French fellow in, in Quebec who, who wanted uh, to lend his voice. And we, we realized, hey, we're really onto something here. If we're doing this in London, Ontario, and doing kind of freelance voiceover work, and there's these other people contacting us um, from around North America, surely it's a pretty broad market. Um, why don't we get out of the production business ourselves uh, and kind of reimagine this uh, website into what has now become a marketplace where we merely facilitate those kind of transactions, if you will, those engagements between the voice talent who are looking to promote themselves, right? Um, showcase their samples of their voice, describe what services they uh, 
can provide, um, client list, and so forth. And then in turn, uh, make all of those you know profiles, if you will, available to those clients that might be looking to hire them. So it could be a, you know, just like for us back in the day, a, from a ha- small business, a hair salon or a floral shop, through to ad agencies and video production companies and. And now some of the world's largest organizations use Voices.com to find a voice talent for whatever their project might be. You touched on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Boy, I could go down a number of different paths here. <laughs> well, but I'm going to just address when you talked about going to the library and signing out the, what did you say, web development for W's? Yeah, yeah. And this is a theme that keeps coming up with no matter who I talk to is that if you're going to move forward and you want to try to figure out how to break new ground, learn something different, expand mm-hmm. your horizons – is that you just get started. You just you jump out, out, out of the plane mm-hmm. and then you try to figure out how to open the chute on the way down. And and I, I mentioned that. I wanted to point that part out of your story and because I think it's going to happen again. Now you've got the concept. Now mm-hmm. what do you do? Um, but to just keep that forward momentum going and then use the tools and resources that are available to you. Mm-hmm. The library. There's all sorts of information Absolutely. there, right? And then it translates into or, or it morphs into the path so, sort of showing itself to you, mm-hmm. which is what it, it sounds like to me is what happened with going through the day-to-day of trying to keep the lights on at the mm-hmm. studio. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you're hearing from voice talent in California exactly. or other parts of the world. And then a light bulb goes off, yep. right? But what was going on during that day-to-day while that process was, was taking place? What kind of work were you doing and how long would you say did it take, David, from the time you did that first, even though you didn't know it was a voiceover at the time, voiceover, to where the two of you were kind of thinking, I think maybe there's a model here that we can apply. Yeah, yeah. Um Probably a year, at least a year. Anyway, I remember. Uh, in fact, we, we keep it just for uh, for memorabilia. I think our our tax return for both of us combined was thirteen thousand dollars that year. Which I'm still curious how do we even uh, like pay for anything, let alone uh, feed uh, at the time our two children. So um, you know, we didn't we didn't make a lot of money. We, you know, we might have had a client or two per month, um, which. I think, you know, because, you know, when you're a sole proprietor, in our case, you know, a small partnership, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're doing everything, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the prospecting uh, to find new, new clients, then the, you know, kind of sales and service support, um, fulfillment, whatever that might look like, um, you know, production, and then, you know, the fi- you're managing all the finances as well, too. So not likely the most efficient um, uh, operation, but... I think it did, did give us both, Stephanie and I, the opportunity to kind of really understand the full kind of gamut of activities that needed to be done in, in running a business. Um, yeah, we, we made, uh, and, and in fact, that kind of, that key word around uh, being resourceful, that's, uh, I think, the polite way of saying that we're cheap, but we're not, we're not cheap. We're just making use and tapping into the resources that we have available. And I think that uh, I mean, there's there's lots of stories um, from us that I'm like, I always kind of question the initial price of something or somebody puts out an estimate. Um, you know, what is that based off of? How is that built up? It goes back to that curiosity idea, right? Like, mm-hmm. let's, let's dig a little bit deeper here. Um, you know, when we, you know, well, I'll, building the first version of the website, um, in fact, we were going to, we did it ourselves, and we looked at having, uh, believe it or not, IBM of all companies uh, doing it back then. And they were, they were, it was going to be like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I mean, like we made thirteen thousand dollars the year before. Two hundred and fifty a quarter mil was just never going to happen for us. Uh, and that's when I'm like, okay, well, if I can pull this off, clearly we've built something of value. Uh, and that was, you know, I think one of those one of those experiences where you weigh. You know, most endeavors, it's kind of a time cost analysis. How much of my time uh, is it going to take to do this? Like learn the skills and do it over and over uh, versus, you know, subcontracting or outsourcing it to someone else. You know, when it comes time to, at least for me, you know, replacing a hot water heater or plumber, you know, plumbing and doing plumbing, like I'm never going to need to use that skill over and over. Um, So therefore, it would be more appropriate that we work with a professional. I'm not going to have the license. I don't have the tools, the knowledge, 
right? It, it, it gets uh, costly from that standpoint. But I felt with web development and trying to teach ourselves kind of enough to be dangerous, enough to kind of get by, um, that that was, you know, time and uh, in energy well invested because we were going to be building ultimately what is a web, a web technology and a web-based business. How much of the architecture of what Voices.com was about to become, mm-hmm. did you and your wife have mapped out in your mind when you first started? Like even at that phase where you're looking to, to get mm-hmm. um, submissions for a website and mm-hmm. IBM's telling you it's going to be a quarter of a million bucks. Oh, yeah. Um, wh- how much of it did you already know that you were going to need? And Well, I think that even that, even that process itself of kind of going to get these tendered offers or, or these bids on that kind of work, it forced us to articulate what it was that we were trying to build. What is the feature set? You know, you said you need these profiles for these voice talent. What, what needs to be on the profile? Literally field by field. Um, do you want photos? Oh, yeah, we're going to need a photo on the, you know, for the thing. Oh, you want to upload audio recording? Okay, how does that happen? Um, you know, then when it came to the job postings, you know, making a request for a voiceover, um, you know, sounds like, oh, okay, I guess you might need a script just to attach that. But, you know, what, what, who are you looking for? The, the language, you know, what language do they speak? The gender, the age range, the, the role that this voiceover is portraying. Are they, um, you know, are they a cowboy? Are they a villain? Are they a wizard? Are they uh, merely a narrator? Or are they a monster truck, monster truck rally, you know, voice? Like, that is a role that's being performed. And then there's the style. Are they funny or are they sarcastic? Are they witty or are they serious, right? And so even, you know, kind of articulating all of this on paper um, to, in effect, you're creating like a software specification document, right? It's a list, it, you know, if you will, it's, it's kind of your wish list. And then I realized we're actually creating a specification document of what needs to be built. And so that's, I think that was one of those exercises that we've learned that the more kind of planning and dreaming in real terms, like on paper and documents um, up front, it really crystallizes that vision that you might have in your head and makes it that much closer to being real that whether you build it yourself or you have somebody else help you in building that, you're going to have that kind of great planning document at your disposal. So how did you get it built? We, uh, the first version is uh, often what's referred to as an MVP, uh, a minimally viable product, like the barrel of minimum that you can kind of get away with that looks suitable. Uh, and that worked for literally like a, another kind of year, year and a half. Um, and, in, and every change, there was no database. There was no login and, and um, you know, a system that people could ed- edit their own profiles as an example. And again, we're going back kind of 10, 11 years now. Uh, Every change that one of our voice talent members, you know, because we got pretty quickly kind of a few dozen to next thing you know is a few hundred people. Every change they wanted to happen, they would literally have to send us an email and say, oh, I changed my address. Can you change what city I'm listed on? Or I've just landed a new client. Can you update my client list? And they were like little text changes. Yeah. And so we would literally have to do that one at a time. And we realized that's the first thing that needs to be built is a way for our community uh, of members to log in and make these changes on their own. We don't want to be doing, you know, simple edits for the rest of our lives. So we we ended up hiring a, a web developer um, to actually create that functionality, literally a, a database of our customers, of our, our voice talent, uh, if you will, and a means for them to log in and edit their profile. That was like the first thing that was built. Uh, then we extended that to... Um, you know, uh, a, a job posting kind of listing where uh, the clients, in this case, the buyers, uh, you know, of, if you will, they would be uh, posting a job uh, of who they were looking for. So we, we needed almost like this submission process. You're either submitting a profile and creating it or you're submitting jobs because uh, and, and that version got, you know, built out, uh, you know, it was kind of done on an hourly basis. And then ultimately we ended up um, kind of stepping back and, and, you know, again, after, I mean, the compressing, uh, you know, speaking of compressing time and compressing, you know, years into, uh, into minutes here, but, um, we, we realized it just needed, you know, if we, 
a complete overhaul. It's like if we were going to do this from scratch, how would we rebuild this? Still, you know, there was a, I mean, we, we had most of it right, but it was just felt a little bit kind of cobbled together. Um, so there was a one point where we just we redid the whole thing. Uh, and that actually was still pretty much the foundation that we have today. So, you know, we've, we've kind of think of it as rebuilding the car. Um, but the challenge becomes is that the car is moving down the highway, right? So you're kind of rebuilding this car in motion and you can't take it down into the shop for four weeks while you rebuild the thing. You got to do it as it's moving along. Uh, so we, so now we're just kind of doing as like little modules at a time, as opposed to a total teardown and then rebuild. That would make NASCAR races more interesting, don't you think? <laughs> it sure would. Exactly. The pit crews had to chase after the cars. <laughs> exactly. They kind of ride in like you know the, the equipment, like the pilot cars going on beside yeah, them. Yeah, that's not a good um, <laughs> safety team suggestion. With that, was it? Once that site was up and going, was it referred to as Voices dot com right from the start? Um, well, funny you ask. We we uh, we originally started as Interactive Voices, which is a bit of a mouthful in and of itself. Um, it was the best domain name I could uh, register at the time. And uh, Interactive Voices, though, it, it every well everyone had their own profile, um, and we actually had really a fully kind of operational site. There were. Um, you know, it really kind of pigeonholed us, if uh, you know, if I may, that into like doing interactive media or new media, and it was it just was not a, a kind of a zippy uh, brand. Um, so, uh, you know, around kind of two thousand seven, two thousand eight, there was all these new web com- companies coming online. Twitter and Flickr and Yahoo was rolling out all these new properties, and everything was kind of big, bright, and bubbly on on the web. Uh, and so, I, you know, Stephanie and both, we really wanted to just kind of rebrand come up with a new name and i i had put in a bid for vox.com uh for a hundred thousand dollars which i totally did not have a hundred thousand dollars um but i figured i'd uh, determine how to come up with the money if we actually won this auction uh but that didn't work out we looked at voxy and voxio and none of them were happening and kind of went back to the drawing board and realized well what if we could just be you know, rather than a name change, like more of a name simplification, just drop this interactive bit. What if we could just be voices.com? And uh, I did what maybe many uh, many of the listeners would do is you, you go to Google, you type it in, and you can do what's called a, a, like a who is lookup, like a re- reverse lookup to find out who owns the name, uh, you know, what's their email address, you know, when does it expire, when was it registered, uh, where, is it, where is it hosted in the world? You can find all this information out. Uh, and it ended up being registered to this fellow in Colorado. Um, and uh, I thought, though, rather than me, David at Interactive Voices, reaching out to him by email uh, and asking him would he sell his domain name and if so, what price, uh, that I would work through a third party, our, our lawyer, in fact. And uh, so Phil sends this fellow an email and asks him would he sell the name, if so, what price. Uh, and he comes back and he says $50,000. I'm like, okay, well... This is half for a domain it, name. For a domain name, fifty thousand. It's not a website, or it's just the name, and you just really kind of transferring rights between your kind of registration accounts for these domain names. And uh, but I figured it was half the price I was willing to pay. So, uh, but still didn't have fifty thousand dollars. So I I went to uh, everyone I knew and and uh, was clearly turned down. And, I, and then I went to the banks, and they're like. Uh, they almost had that same reaction, like, so are you building a new website? Or, you know, is it? And I'm like, no, no, no. They're like, any new technology here? And I'm like, nope, just the name. And uh, and they're like, no, we, we can't can't get behind that. Like, uh, and and uh, and that's when actually Phil, uh, our lawyer, taught us an important lesson, uh, which was to really never take no for an answer. I mean, the good news is the fellow was willing to sell the name, uh, and it was you know, up for grabs, it was just really kind of a matter of price. And so, uh, I figured I'd go back with, uh, with a counter offer and say, uh, well, how about 30,000? But here's, here's the thing. I, I'm going to pay you $5,000 every quarter for the next six quarters. So five times six is $30,000. So with that, he went for the deal. So for $5,000, which I think I foolishly, uh, cash advanced on a credit card or something horrendous you should never do. Um, we were able to get ownership over this domain name voices.com and it was only over a weekend that we really uh, relaunched the server a service it was it was literally copying 
all the files from one server, think of it in one folder on your computer, into another folder. That was like pretty much as easy as it was. Uh, and, and then all future traffic of people that were trying to access the old website, um, it was like one of those mail redirects where you just kind of redirect all the traffic automatically. So even if they typed in interactive voices, they would automatically show up at voices.com. And people were thrilled. They, it, was, it, was a, it was a name that, you know, it was succinct. It was memorable. It said what we did. It was one that they wanted to be part of. You know, they, they, they saw that there was potential here. And I think it gave, uh, gave the impression that uh, not only that we were a much larger than we actually were, but uh, that we'd been around forever. Um, but they, you know, that it, I think it spoke to something bigger than, uh, than we were currently at and, and spoke to a really positive future. I think you just answered part of what I was going to ask you next, which was how did you know that at that point that the name, the domain was, was going to make that much of a difference? It's a gamble either mm-hmm. way. Oh, for sure. Um, and there's a chunk missing that I, I'm hoping we can go back and, mm-hmm. and fill in. That's just before that point, but still, you were willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars that you didn't have, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you were willing to pay fifty thousand dollars which you didn't have, and you mm-hmm. ended up paying thirty thousand which you didn't have. Which I didn't. Really Although it have, sounds yeah. like you know you you only paid the five that you didn't have, and then gave yourself a chance to to catch up. Exactly. Um, but <laughs> how did you like? Wh- if you're so sure of it that you're going to bankers and lawyers and. Uh, over a name, over a domain, people that don't live in that world and mm-hmm. understand how that all works. Mm-hmm. You must have had ample opportunity to doubt yourself. And then, well, maybe it's not that important. That is a lot of money for mm-hmm. us. Like, but how well, are you so uh, well, sure? Well, on that, it's funny because uh, the the name um, that was previously registered, I said, uh, you know, it, it was, there was a site at the time. It was actually called silencing the critical voices in your head it was this medical journal from this you know from the the fellow who owned it it was his i think it was his sister that was a, a medical journal and she was a psychologist so she was writing about uh of, of various issues on that subject matter um so yeah certainly i was i you know there's 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 doubt that uh that creeps in um but there was this kind of mental mental model that was uh that was once shared with me uh, when it comes to these big uh, decisions of, you know, do I move forward? You know, yes and no. Um, you know, you highlighted earlier that it really is a matter of, yes, you need to move forward, but how do you know if it's the right decision? And um, it's called the 10 10 10 model. And you got to ask yourself, is this the right decision? Am I going to be happy with this decision 10 minutes from now, 10 months from now, and 10 years from now? So, if something might be tempting in the moment, 10 minutes from now, oh, yeah, I think I can live with it. 10 months from now, oh, I might be regretting it. 10 years from now, my life could be in shambles, right? But if it's an opportunity, something like this, where 10 minutes from now, I'm probably going to be like, oh, my goodness, now I'm, I'm really stressed. We've got to figure this thing out. 10 months from now, you know, especially with this domain name, like those payments, we, you know, wow, we, we got the first payment done. We got the second. This is getting really hard to keep, keep up with these payments of 5,000, um, but 10 years later, I look back, I mean, it hasn't been quite 10 years yet, but I look back and I still say that that was the single biggest turning point in the evolution of the company because it, it became the rallying points and the point of identity that now we've got a name that we can focus on. So that's the mental model that I use to filter out, how am I gonna feel about this decision 10 minutes, 10 months, and 10 years from now. Here's the part that I think that I'd like to fill in with the story if you're willing to, Mm -hmm. because I think it's important for people that are listening and learning. Let's go back (laughs) 10 minutes Mm -hmm. (laughs) ago uh, to where you were talking about wanting to get the original site built, that between you and and your wife, you'd made Mm $13,000 the year before. You got a quote from IBM for two hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars just to build the platform mm-hmm. that that was a, going to eventually become Voices dot com, right? Um, but even more immediately, interactive voices. Mm-hmm. It, as much as you're comfortable telling me, what was the jumping off point there that got you online and got that part of the business going? Like, in other words, um, you decided I'm hearing not to try to find a quarter of a million dollars and go with IBM at that point, 
But what did you go with, and how did you manage that? Yeah, I think, um, well, we, I mean, because we have that uh, initial uh, recording studio equipment, we actually, uh, you know, we uh, we had our first childs, and then our second around that time, and we realized this whole kind of living in the living and uh, recording music in the same uh, locale was not going to be very sustainable over the long run. And so we ended up really kind of scaling back. You know, one of the first things to go was actually my drum set. I mean, there was nowhere to play drums, no reason to be playing drums. Uh, then sold off this big keyboard, and we were kind of just left with literally the computer and microphone. So, you know, how did we kind of self-fund? Well, we pretty much liquidated the studio equipment that, that, that we had. Um, and all we were left with was a microphone and a computer. So we kind of made, made a go at that. Um, the other thing that, you know, that, uh, that certainly comes to mind was that we continued to teach ourselves skills that of the things that we knew we needed to do for like web design, web development, marketing on the internet. And as we did, we kind of gained more and more traction. And it was actually when it was that initial website that had, um, you know, as I say, a few, a few dozen people on it, we realized, well, let's, you know, kind of do our first, you know, our first, uh, MVP. And, uh, the way we promoted that actually our, our, our initial version, if you will, was, uh, we, we wrote this long, uh, email newsletter, uh, type, uh, it was not exactly a newsletter. It was just, it was just a long form email. Um, and we, Stephanie messaged, couple hundred people and said hey here's what we're doing we're, we're already getting traffic to this website uh we're launching a new one and uh we're giving you know it's gonna have one purpose to find you voiceover work and uh explaining kind of our process and what we're going to do and how we believe that we could be successful there was an ask at the end and we said for uh 49 dollars for the year uh, we will market you online and it was literally that simple there was a link to Uh, a page on our website that kind of went into some other uh, detail. And there was a link to the PayPal um, as well in the email and on, on this one web page that we had uh, for the new site, uh, which was interactive voices. And we, the night, I mean, we did this on a Friday night. Uh, We woke up on the Saturday morning with $5,000 in our PayPal account. So we got a hundred people for kind of that 50 bucks for the year. And that's when we realized everything's always $5,000, $5,000. We realized <laughs> that's the seed capital. That's, that's what we had to like really go at it. We realized, well, we basically got ourselves some breathing room. We now need to go full force into delivering on that promise. We just told a hundred people we were going to market them online and find them voiceover work. Now, how do we go make that happen? Which was, uh, learning about search engine optimization, writing how to's and tutorials. Um, you know, this was the very first version of blogging, uh, was out. Um, there was a, well, a company that Google owns now called blogger and Stephanie blogged for a year, uh, before even somebody, the first kind of comment, but she has, she had so much knowledge, um, of the space. I made hundreds, if not thousands of phone calls. I mean, we just, we just went at it, you know? Uh, and when people started getting work, then they would tell other their their friends or talent that they work with in their uh, community, and then they would come on online. So there's three ways that you can get capital or you know financing to to start a company. Uh, there's the first way which we did, which was uh, through cash from customers or cash from literally selling something to your customers. Which, in my opinion, is the best because you don't owe anything to anybody other than delivering on that service. The next up is sure you can borrow money, uh, you know, or some kind of creative financing, which we employed to actually get the domain name. We kind of, you know, we we made a, a deal, an arrangement where, yeah, sure, we we borrowed money from the credit card up front to get that money. It's for the domain name, and then we we you know had to earn it and pay back uh, over the long run and of course there's other bank loans uh, that that uh, we've acquired over the years and pay those down and then get bigger bank loans and pay those down and, and that cycle repeats and then the last one would be those investors and and most people think oh technology company uh you know is funded by investors you know they put half million or a couple million dollars in and 
the trouble with that, though, is, yeah, sure, it gets you a lot of money up front, but they immediately own 40 or 50 percent of the company right off the bat. And uh, a lot of the kind of scariest uh, entrepreneurial stories that I hear of are, are from those founders who, after a round or two of financing, you know, you, you, you burn through your first two million and then you got to go back to the investors and say, now we need five and you get diluted. It means you get less and less of a percentage of ownership each time. And next thing you know, you, you literally, while you may have been a founder, you don't own anything left in the company, like literally nothing. So we, uh, Stephanie and I, have taken the approach of let's try to grow Voices.com by delivering an amazing service, something that actually people will pay for. And, uh, and where we need to kind of supplement that and, and accelerate even faster um, than, we've, than we've borrowed from uh, various banks, as I said, pay those down, uh, generate a track record and a history uh, that we would borrow more and pay that down and, and as I say, just kind of repeat that, uh, repeat that cycle. So that, that's how we finance the company. You're good at giving me um, <laughs> a whole bunch of things that I want to follow up yeah. on. Uh, time is going to, um, to make me choose. Mm-hmm. I could gladly ask you for a whole conversation on just how has um, the business association between you and your wife uh, affected the relationship in the family and mm-hmm. we're not going to go down that rabbit mm-hmm. hole but the fact that you're all and because I know you a little bit I know that that's good but that's mm-hmm. a whole separate challenge I'd mm-hmm. love to ask you about I wanted to ask you about how did you choose $49 kind of because of what you had said earlier about where's the jumping off point mm-hmm. for somebody that liked airplanes and, and Lego and then just wanted to be a drummer to all of a sudden just acquiring this knowledge as you go about now dealing with investors and processes mm-hmm. and loans and scale and all that. We could go off on all of these areas, mm-hmm. but if it's okay, I'd like to take the few minutes that we've, we've got left of your time and talk maybe a little bit more specifically about voices and mm-hmm. kind of what it has become versus what you just described. And mm-hmm. unfortunately we're going to have to skip over um, quite a little bit, but the scale of the workforce, how your mm. days are different from back at that because 10 years is not a very long time, Dave, mm-hmm. you know, it goes by like that. Yeah, right. For sure. And, um, but what is your life like now mm-hmm. as opposed to, and even the day to day of what happens and trying to run the company as opposed to what it was like maybe after you just got that voices domain? Yeah, we, um, I mean, it's certainly different and I need to, you know, pause and recognize that. I think that's, uh, that's important. Um, that, the responsibilities that uh, Stephanie and I both once had, which started literally on a piece of paper that we drew a line down the middle with each of our names at the top and said, here's what I'm going to do, and here's what you're going to do, and let's agree upon this right off the bat, to now, which are you know formal job descriptions through, through the entire company, and that kind of um, – and roles and responsibilities in, in, uh, in departments. And this is all things that kind of uh, – evolved and, and scaled up to which is now you know there's 112 people that work at voices.com right now and those are full-time employees uh here in london um and we serve a community of uh you know 250,000 um you know users if you will there's 125,000 clients who want to work with those 125,000 voice talents so you know, certainly a far cry from the, the those humble beginnings. Um, but we think there's a lot, you know, uh, more to go, and, and it's, a, it's a big space, and it's an exciting space. And, it's gonna, and, and not only are we growing in it, but, the, I, I, you know, from what we can tell, the industry is growing as well, too, so we think that's healthy. Um, day-to-day, um, you know, it's uh, – you need to ask yourself, uh, what is it that I need to do today? And – there's a lot packed into that. It's not just what needs to be done, um, but understanding there are certain things that only I can do as the CEO of the company. And there are other activities or responsibilities that maybe multiple people can do. So I should really learn, and I've tried to <laughs> develop the responsi- or uh, discipline, I should say, to let other people do manage their areas of the business and 
if you've hired great people, you should be able to trust them and empower them to make those decisions uh, and, and, and run that, uh, run that group. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of it is, you know, you know, my day to day is, uh, is a couple, uh, pieces. I'm probably one of very few people who kind of bridges the gap between the internal operations and the external world, right? The internal world of the life and culture at voices and the external world. And that could be through, um, key client relationships. We talked about the investors and bankers, um, consultants, um, you know, media opportunities and future employees. These are all kind of external parties that kind of get a glimpse of what it's like at voices. So Stephanie and I kind of bridge that gap, you know, and that's kind of, again, it's another one of these like uh, visuals, but that's, that's kind of how we see our, our day to day uh, going. And so, um, practically it's, uh, it's frankly kind of just packed with lots of meetings and, and, uh, um, you know, lots of, lots of new people and, uh, really telling, uh, in some ways, uh, truthfully, a lot of the, a lot of the same stories, um, and, uh, and giving a glimpse of, of where we started, where we're at now and, and where we hope to be in the future. As opposed to picking a point in the distance and thinking, I want to get there and then figuring out how to do it. How fair is it to suggest, David, that you and and Stephanie have continued to drive forward, of course, but recognized potential opportunity as it's come along and then chosen to pursue it, upgrade your knowledge and skills accordingly and adjust as you go? Um, Yeah, I think actually that being able to... Uh, I think that's an important skill to have, actually, um, being able to have a degree of uh, of intuition um, to be able to spot an opportunity and have the willingness to, like, capitalize on that and seize it right in front of you. Um, you know, expanding our office is a great one. Uh, when is it the right time to take on another 2,000 square feet or another 10,000 square feet? Like, so those are big commitments because you're locked in for multiple years. So sometimes the, the opportunity comes up and you're like, if I don't take it now, it's gone and I'm going to be struggling. Um, so there's an element of uh, being confident in your ability to make decisions. So that's why I always encourage people to make a, have a decision-making framework like I just described. Sure. And then make a lot of little decisions because if you can make small decisions and feel great about them, when it comes to the big one, it's just another decision. Yeah, it's the bigger scale, bigger impact, but it's just another decision. Uh, and you go through evaluating alternatives and, and you know and so forth. But you know you got to you, you ultimately need to be able to to live with that. Um, yeah, I think there's you know it's no one has the crystal ball. You can't look out too too far. You know we have big goals and ambitions, but. I would, you know, I'd say there's, it's, it's a surprising amount of when something's kind of right in front of you and you just, just go for it. Right. And just make the most of, uh, the tools and the technology and the resources and relationships that are, um, that you surround yourself with, or you feel you have access to and tap into those. And by doing that, you've almost created this, um, just, just tremendous wave of momentum that isn't likely to slow down. Did you ever get another drum set? I haven't, and that's funny you bring that up because my uh, one of my daughters uh, was asking. She's like, "Mom, we w- we want to get a drum set for Dad. I think he'd really like to play drums again. So we'll see. Maybe we can jam. Sometime. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to do that. Thank you so much um, for this time, David. It's really cool to be able to dig into it. And as I've said, if we ever get the opportunity to do it again, I think any one of the number of subjects that I mentioned, plus at least a half dozen that are also rattling yeah. around in my mind, could easily fill another hour or so. But uh, um, it's, re- it's really cool. Congratulations. Oh, and, thank and, you. and thank you for the time. All right. Great to be here. At the time of this recording, Voices.com is being followed by over 300,000 people across Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube combined. You can connect as well at Voices on Twitter, at Voices.com on Facebook, and that's all spelled out. So V-O-I-C-E-S-D-O-T 
C-O-M, Voices.com, spell it like one word on Facebook. So Facebook.com slash Voices.com. And on LinkedIn slash company slash Voices.com. Now there it's the Voices and the actual dot and dot com. Or just go to any of those platforms and do the search for Voices.com and I'm sure that you'll find them. As for me, I'd love for you to join me online at KevinBolmer.com. My last name is B as in Bob, U-L, M as in Mary, E-R. NoScheduleman.com will take you to the same place. Or join me on Facebook and Twitter. Just look for No Schedule Man and you'll find us. I'd love to hear from you. So drop us a comment there or on YouTube or SoundCloud. And please do take a moment to subscribe to this podcast at iTunes for more great personal development stories and lessons as we all grow together. Thanks again for taking the time to listen. And remember, as the No Schedule Man says, I'll get there when I get there. Just make sure you keep moving. We'll catch you next time on the No Schedule Man podcast. Just a little deja vu.